IWUOT. I'm Joyce Dedekian. Tonight, we're taking a closer look at the role of occupational therapy in mental health services in the St. Louis area. Brittany is in the field with a practitioner and instructor at the Washington University School of Medicine program in occupational therapy. Brittany? Thank you, Joyce. I'm Brittany Miner, OT student reporter, and I'm here with Jeannie Kleckner at the Clayton Child Center. Uh, Jeannie, could you please, well, I've already said your name, state your position, years of experience, and background for us here, please? Yes, I can. Thank you. Um, my name is Jeannie Kleckner. I'm a pediatric therapist, and I've been practicing 31 years. I've been fortunate enough to work in a variety of settings, acute care hospital, including NICU, preschool, a lot of years school age, um, and now um, private clients. Wow, that is a lot of experience. So in all of your time working, have you seen emotional disorders or mental health disorders that impact children behaviorally or emotionally at school or home or any other context? <laughs> Absolutely. There is growing recognition of um, bipolar disorder with children. It is a very different um, scenario than it is with adults, so it wasn't recognized um, initially. Um, also depression with children is being more recognized. And a lot of children who are on the spectrum with ADD, ADHD, mm -hmm. Asperger's, autism, also can have a secondary depression or anxiety um, related to the social struggles and being different from peers. Oh, okay, wow. Um, so how does that affect their home life? Do you know at all? Um, it can have a huge impact on school life and home life. Okay. Um, there are a number of children who hold it together at school mm -hmm. and then they come home and just fall apart okay. and melt down and um, can make um, family life very difficult, can make every aspect of family life difficult. Okay. So, um, could you please explain uh, what the possible secondary impact on a child is that occurs from having a parent with a mental health disorder or a parent who's dependent on substances? Certainly. Um, historically, we for many years had the nature versus nurture debate. Mm -hmm. And what is recognized now is that our genetics um, give us the, the building blocks, the blueprint for our brain architecture, and that um, the value, the tremendous importance of environment comes through the whole concept of neuroplasticity, mm -hmm. that what we do, what we think, what we feel impacts the growth of synapses, the actual wiring and circuitry of the brain, and that the interplay of genetics and environment um, is massive mm -hmm. and huge. And so if, if you have a child in a, uh, with a home life that is unstable, unpredictable, um, violent, um, characterized by um, homelessness or a lack of basic life, have lack of food um, that has a massive impact on the neuroplasticity. Um, a lot of these children um, are significantly challenged with emotional regulation. Uh, so what theories do you use with children who experience mental health and behavioral and emotional disorders? Um, almost any theory can be applied to this population. Um, certainly a developmental perspective, depending on the age of the child. Um, certainly also a behavioralist approach of what are the challenging behaviors. I like to think of it as a humanistic perspective of where is this child? Um, where have, what have they come from? What are they living in? And where would they like to go? Where would their parents like them to go? What are the next steps? And to take a really broad picture of not just what do they need to do in third grade mm -hmm. to successfully complete third grade, 
but what are the cha life challenges for this child? Right. And how can we um, support them to be as successful as possible in the biggest picture? So what kind of interventions do you use with this population? The inter interventions I use are in the umbrella of self-regulation. Okay. And it's a fortunately a very large umbrella, so that it can incorporate the whole self-awareness of how do I feel, and what is my behavior, what is my observable behavior like, and where do I want to be, how do I want to be in the classroom, or how do I want to be at home, and what are the steps to get there. And it can include um, a host, a litany of strategies that might be a sensory diet, or it might be just a strategy of um, deep breathing before um, yelling out an answer. Yeah. Um, it might be a, a practice of um, conversation with a peer or mm -hmm. an adult. It might be practice of a greeting and what are the components of a greeting. Eye contact, facial expression, mm -hmm. tone of voice, saying some sort of greeting, saying this person's name, and then saying something in addition, like how are you or you look nice today. Mm -hmm. So it could be direct, explicit practice of um, a social skill. Okay. It could be something um, as open as coloring a picture to express how you feel and getting some awareness um, through that activity. Okay, wonderful. So how do you believe OT is unique to help children who have mental health, behavioral, and emotional disorders? Well, I believe that um, as OTs we are in a, an ideal and in a unique position. We have awareness of development. We have knowledge about best practice. We um, work with individuals, groups, and populations. And um, we can help bridge the gap between what we know um, from scientific research and how things are done in terms of early intervention and early enriching. Um, experiences and as OTs we can assist policymakers and civic leaders with those insights to um, bridge that gap and create the best possible outcomes for children um, to um, help with educational reform to look at um, reducing violence um, facilitating learning and behavioral skills. So we're in a great position. Yeah, I think those are all wonderful things that OTs can do with this population. Well, thank you for talking to us today, Jeannie. Back to you, Joyce. <coughs> thank you. We're back with your stunning and modest news anchor, Joyce. <clears throat> Next, we're going to hear from CJ, who's in the field with Liz Brisky. She's going to be discussing student involvement in the Queen of Peace program. CJ? Yes, yes, Joyce, I'm here. Thank you. Here we are, live in front of the Queen of Peace and Cathedral Tower, where we'll go to interview a student volunteer. Come on. So, Liz, thank you for being with us today. We really appreciate you taking the time out to interview. No problem. So. As we get started, could you first tell us a little bit about Queen of Peace, the organization, and then share with us what you've been doing there? Yep. Um, Queen of Peace is a home for women who have had um, substance abuse disorders and mental health issues. Um, one of the unique things about Queen of Peace is that their children also get to live with them in this home. So it's a pretty big facility, and they have housing on site, and they have a couple houses that are off-site that the women also live at. And they have um, all their needs met there. They have their me meals, they have social work, um, they have other therapy, there's a child care center. That's phenomenal. Okay, so what are you doing there? So at Queen of Peace, um, there have been a lot of occupational therapy students who have come and volunteered there. Um, some of the things we do are we help with the kids club, which is um, for kids who are ages about 5 to 14 and we create uh, groups. So some of the groups that I've created are a variety of um, IADLs such as communication skills, social skills, 
um, promoting wellness, promoting physical activity. Um, we've done yoga, and I use a lot of different uh, interactive media because lots of the kids haven't been exposed to um, a lot of uh, developmentally appropriate uh, play play toys. Um, so I've used YouTube, I've used uh, sensory boxes, I've used um, clay, paint, markers, basically anything I can get my hands on. We've even done some activities involving coins and eggs. <laughs> wow, very creative. Yes. Could you give me an example of a specific activity that you guys have done? Yes, um, we've done an activity um, called a self-esteem self shield where um, we created, uh, we talked about what self-esteem is and um, we talked about why it's important and we created a shield that had our name and drew a picture and you know what we want to be when we grow up, what kind of activities we like to do and then we passed around our shield and had each other write our names or write something that they like about um, the person on each of the shields. So it really promoted not only um, like self-esteem and feeling good and then talking about activities that they like to participate in, but also um, that social interaction, which is really important. That is so great. Well, Liz, tell me about uh, what you think the impact that the student volunteer efforts have had at Queen of Peace. Um, well, when we first came to Queen of Peace, uh, we work with social workers there um, mostly, and they did not know what occupational therapists were or um, that they, we even existed. So um, as OT students, we kind of educated the social workers on what OT is, and they loved um, seeing some things from a different perspective and have asked our opinion about um, certain cases involving like the sensory regulation and involving some behaviors from a different perspective. So it's enjoyable and um, I think we've had a great impact on the kids of, as well. I've noticed uh, kids who at the beginning were very, very shy. Um, we come and we help um, them to participate um, and they've kind of come out of their shell because we kind of help the kids to explore different toys and different play uh, options and really get the kids involved in exactly what they want to do and participate. Yes, that is so amazing and I know it's uh, definitely very valuable to those children to have people who care and are truly invested in their success. So why did you all decide to get involved with Queen of Peace? Uh, well, personally for me, I really enjoy working with pediatrics and I really enjoy mental health and um, I would really like to work in a mental health setting that involves pediatrics, but um, I know that the number of occupational therapists have decreased in mental health settings even though that's where occupational therapy started in. Mm -hmm. So I thought this was a great opportunity to combine two things that I love and volunteer there. Excellent, and I'm sure that's true for all of the volunteers. Thank you again for interviewing with us, and before we go, are there any final words you'd like to share with our viewers? Yes, um, I think um, mental health occupational therapy is so important, and it's something that um, we need to stay aware of. There's a lot of new legislation coming out, so keeping in the know about that, and also visiting the American Occupational Therapy Association's website. Um, there's always um, mental health information on there and uh, information about the legislation and you can also get involved in your state occupational therapy association. Thank you CJ and Liz. Stay tuned. After the break, we'll be back with an enthralling segment that looks at the fascinating life cycle of the earthworm. Mm -hmm. 